Today I'm going to finish off on myotensitic transformations uh, from the last lecture. And just to remind you, there are more resources available on this website and also in this book, uh, which may contain more detail than you actually need for this course, but you may find it useful. Now, I finished off the last lecture by summarizing some difficulties. Um, two of these difficulties I demonstrated to you, uh, and this is a difficulty that I foresaw. So we observe strange, irrational habit planes with odd indices close to 3, 10, 15, 2, 5, 9, and so forth. Why, why isn't it as simple as in slip, where things happen on closed back planes? And we also noted that although the orientation relationships are described by terms such as Kojimo Sachs and Nishiyama Vasman, they're not accurate because the real orientation relationship is irrational. Um, for example, the closed back planes are not exactly parallel, but deviate by an angle of the order of half a degree or so. Why is that? When That is uh, only revealed when we do accurate measurements, which is why um, the Kojimo Sachs and Nishiyama Vasman orientations are so widely reported because they're usually based on imprecise measurements. Now, we also demonstrated by experiment that the observed shape deformation is an invariant plane strain. That means it leaves a plane completely coherent between the martensite and austenite. And I mentioned in passing that actually if I take that deformation and apply it to austenite, it doesn't give me the correct crystal structure of martensite. So something is wrong here. Uh, we will prove that it is actually impossible to transform austenite into body-centered cubic or body-centered tetragonal martensite by a deformation which is an invariant plane strain. The best we can get is an invariant line strain, which leaves a single line unrotated and undistorted, in other words, coherent. Now, the structures that we are interested in uh, are illustrated here. Uh, we have the austenite, which has a cubic F lattice with, an, uh, uh, with a motif of an atom at each lattice point. And we have the body-centered cubic lattice with a lattice point uh, with, a, with an atom at each lattice point. Okay? So that's ferrite and that's austenite and we use the symbols alpha and gamma respectively. Now, how do I deform homogeneously the lattice of the austenite into that of the ferrite or martensite? Well, Bain came up with this in 1924. Uh, if you draw two unit cells of austenite together, uh, like so, you can identify a different atomic arrangement, which is a body-centered tetragonal austenite. Okay, so we've done no transformation yet. This is simply um, a relabeling of the unit cell, you know, because there, there's uh, many ways in which we can actually draw the unit cell, and we usually choose the one that best reflects the symmetry of the lattice, but this red representation is perfectly acceptable representation of the unit cell of austenite. Uh, the, the aspect ratio is quite large. Um, this, this parameter is roughly 1.24 times that of uh, the uh, 001 of the red cell. Now, the point of this exercise is that it shows easily how I could convert this into body-centered cubic or a more realistic body-centered tetragonal aspect ratio. It's very simple, you compress along this direction and uniformly expand in the basal plane here, okay? And that gives us the body-centered cubic lattice of martensite and the distortions, that means the initial, uh, the final length over the initial length, are uh, defined as eta three, which is along OO one, 
is the lattice parameter of side divided by that of Osnet. And eta1 and eta2 are identical and equal to root 2 into A alpha over A gamma, because this is along a 110 type direction. Okay, so that is the brain strain. And there are many, many experiments which show that this is the best way to achieve the deformation. In, a, uh, in other words, it involves the smallest displacements. And the experimental proof for this is that when the atoms in the austenite are ordered, we expect this deformation and no other to produce this kind of uh, transformation. Okay, so this is the deformation which carries the austenite into the martensite. And this indicates that the orientation relationship should be very simple, that 001s of the two lattices are parallel and 100 of the ferrite is parallel to a bar 110 of the, or uh, one bar 10 of the austenite. And the 010 of the ferrite is parallel to a 110 of the austenite. So that's an exact orientation. So it clearly can't be right. So this involves a compression along the vertical axis and expansion along both the other axis. And it leaves no line whatsoever undistorted because everything in the basal plane is expanded, okay? And everything in this vertical plane is compressed. So there is no invariant line at all, which, uh, which means that uh, we can't satisfy the condition for martensite. So just uh, representing that again over here, uh, zero, zero, 001 directions there and 100 zero, zero of alpha parallel to 1 bar 10 and so on. Now, if I represent my austenite as a sphere, in this case, a red colored sphere, uh, then as a result of the Bain strain along the vertical axis, a compression and along the horizontal axis, uh, uniform expansion, that sphere will change into an ellipsoid of revolution about 001. Uh, so this is a section of that. Uh, and what I want to show you is, uh, what I want to illustrate uh, is that this line here, OB and OA, as a consequence of the Bain strain, become OA dashed and OB dashed, and they have exactly the same length. But they are not invariant lines because they have changed orientation, yeah? So if you've changed orientation, then that is not an invariant line. So this, this Bain strain doesn't produce any invariant line as I explained earlier. Now, supposing that I take this Martin side and add a rigid body rotation, okay? Uh, so a rigid body rotation so that one of these lines becomes coincident with the other. Okay, that's the rigid body rotation. And the lines OA and OA dash become coincident, and these go further out of this registry. So by taking the Bain strain, combining it, it with a rigid body rotation, we can produce an invariant line between the two lattices. And a rigid body rotation doesn't change any crystal structure, so it's perfectly okay to do that. So B is the Bain strain and R the rigid body rotation, BR, gives us an invariant line strain. But there is absolutely no possibility of finding a rotation that will produce two invariant lines. In other words, it's impossible to produce an invariant plane strain. And yet the shape deformation that we observe is an invariant plane strain. Okay, so that is the, uh, one of the issues that we need to tackle. So just to summarize, the, or, uh, sorry, I forgot to explain that this uh, rigid body rotate combination of the rigid body rotation and the Bain strain perfectly explains the irrational orientation relationship that we observe experimentally. So the Bain orientation isn't the correct one, but once you've added the rigid body rotation, that explains accurately 
the observed orientation relationship, which is irrational. And all because we need an invariant line in the interface. So we have solved the problem of the irrational orientation relationship. Uh, the shape deformation is inconsistent with the combination of the Bain strain and the rigid body rotation, because that only leaves uh, an invariant line. And we haven't explained the strange habit plane indices. Now, back in 1953, uh, there was simultaneous work by Bowles and Mackenzie in Australia and Wexler, Lieberman and Reed in the US where this entire problem was solved. Okay? So I'm going to explain that schematically, but it is a mathematical theory which made certain predictions which were verified after the predictions were made. And it also shows that all the characteristics of a plate of modern site are connected mathematically. So if you have a certain habit plane, then the displacement direction, the orientation relationship, and the nature of the shape deformation is not independent, okay? So all these characteristics are connected for one plate of martensite. So, you know, if you do independent measurements to find the shape deformation, the orientation, that doesn't prove the theory that I'm going to explain to you. You've got to do all the measurements on a single plate. Okay, so let's imagine that this is our crystal of austenite. Uh, and I've deliberately made it this shape, but that's okay. And when it transforms into martensite, we observe a shape change, which is like a shear, but there's also a volume change. So I'm going to do that. And this is the observed shape of the martensite when we start with austenite of this shape. But we have proved that there is no invariant plane strain that can transform austenite into BCC martensite. Therefore, this is the wrong crystal structure, okay? And I'm writing the invariant plane strain as P1. Now, in order to actually get the right crystal structure, uh, I have to realize that if I add two invariant plane strains, then the line of intersection remains invariant to both of them. In other words, a combination of two invariant plane strains gives you an invariant line strain. So I'm going to add another shear deformation, but on a different plane to the original, because these are two independent uh, invariant plane strains. And this time we get the correct crystal structure because the combination of P1 and P2 is the invariant line strain, okay? required invariant line strain. But now this is the wrong shape because we don't actually see that as the shape. This is what is observed experimentally. So that is a summary of the problem, okay? Now, supposing that I can deform this without changing its crystal structure so that its macroscopic shape becomes this, okay? What kind of deformation does not change the crystal structure? Slip doesn't, okay? When you have dislocations gliding through, they don't change the crystal structure, they simply cause a deformation. And mechanical twinning doesn't change the crystal, uh, crystal structure, it simply reorients it and is a deformation. So we could use either of those to correct the shape without changing the crystal structure. So here, for example, if I periodically twin this crystal, and this was a prediction made before observations, uh, then, you uh, then you see these mechanical uh, twins inside the plate of martensite. Of course, they're not forming independently. They all form as the interface moves. And the really interesting thing is that, look, even if these facets are rational planes, the average plane can be anything depending on how much of this lattice invariant deformation we add, uh, in this case, twinning, okay? And this completely explains the odd irrational habit planes that we observe. Now, of course, you are left with twin interfaces inside the martensite, and that has a cost associated with it. The second is by twinning, uh, by slipping, sorry, periodic slipping. And 
all you do now is you leave slip steps and even if these are rational this average plane will not be and hence the strange habit plane indices now you might ask why in some cases we observe slip martin site and in other in other cases internally twinned martin site and the answer is that when the martin site forms incredibly rapidly then a twin interface is more glissile than one which involves just a glide of dislocations okay so when it forms rapidly, it might form at large driving forces or at high strain rates. And that's when we observe uh, internal twinning. Otherwise, uh, we observe a slipped mite inside with no substructure inside. Okay. Now, thermodynamically, this is never favored because you've got this cost of twin interfaces, which you don't have here. It's simply the greater mobility of a twinned interface compared with a slipped interface. This is a fantastic theory and everything, you know, the habit plane, the orientation relationship, the shape deformation in going from here to here can be predicted from a knowledge of the lattice parameters and by uh, noting the planes on which you have to shear the final shape here to obtain the macroscopic invariant plane strain. And having the macroscopic strain as an invariant plane strain reduces the strain energy as compared with just stopping here, which would result in a much larger shape deformation. So this theory is really a triumph of uh, very clever people who enabled us to completely estimate the crystallography and the deformation due to martensitic transformation. Now, uh, in terms of uh, looking at a plate, this is, this is how the slip steps are distributed and this is how the twinning is distributed at some angle to the, uh, to the plate. And you can see here that there's a cost of twin interfaces and these were predicted before uh, electron microscopy could be used to observe them because they are very finely spaced. And the first observation was using uh, carbon replicas, which only gives us the trace of the twin interfaces. And then Shimitsu <coughs> in Japan was able to make a thin foil and show these twins. And here is an example. Uh, extremely finely spaced transformation twins inside the interface. I should point out that all the procedures that we've described, like the main strain, rigid body rotation, and the uh, lattice invariant deformations, they all happen as the boundary moves, okay? So they're not separate deformations. You mustn't think of them as like that, but it's just that we need to factorize the deformations to understand them. Now, there isn't just one martin Cedric transformation that occurs in steels. Uh, we've talked about the face-centered cubic to the body-centered cubic or slightly body-centered tetragonal lattices. Uh, but you can also get hexagonal closed-packed martin site in uh, alloys of iron. So this is a much easier transformation to understand because, uh, as you know, the closed-packed planes inside the osmanite are arranged like so in ABC, ABC stacking with a repeat period of three. And to change that into a hexagonal closed back lattice uh, involves simply changing the stacking sequence uh, to AB, AB, AB with a repeat period of two. And the way in which this happens is that on every second plane, we have to pass a dislocation which changes the stacking sequence from ABC to ABA. So imagine that this is a closed pack plane and these atoms are located on A sides. This is a, a, a B and C where the other uh, layers could be stacked. And a lattice vector is A by 2, 1, 1, 0 here. Uh, of course, a dislocation with a lattice factor cannot change the stacking sequence, okay? 
but uh, this lattice vector can be divided into two partial dislocations, which are known as Shockley partials. And a partial dislocation has a Burgers vector that is not a lattice vector. And that means that when it glides, it will leave a fault behind, right? In other words, it changes the local stacking fault sequence. And each one of these lattice dislocations can split into two partials here. So this is a by six, two, one, one, and a by six, one, two, bar one. And the way you can just find these indices is wherever there's a one, there's got to be a combination of a two and a one because two plus one divided by six gives us a half. And uh, you simply swap the positions of the two and the ones. And since this is zero, the last two here must add up to zero. Okay, so it's very simple. So if we pass a Shockley partial, one of these dislocations, on every second close back plane, that gives us the HP lattice. So the displacement is A by 6, 1, 1, 2. And if we divide by the spacing of two close back planes, then that gives us the magnitude of the shear that's necessary to change the FCC lattice to the BCC, uh, to the HCP lattice. So the magnitude of this vector is A over root six, uh, A is the lattice parameter of the austenite, and the D spacing is two times A over root three for two of these planes. And therefore, the shear deformation is one over square root of eight. So um, the Martin side itself looks very much like Martensite. So this, this is uh, um, HCP Martensite and there is some retained austenite as well. Uh, so when we observe it optically, it looks uh, very similar, but it tends to be uh, with an aspect ratio which is much smaller than what we associated with BCC Martensite. It's roughly of the order of 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. Uh, the reason being that, you know, you've got to be able to have a mechanism to generate these uh, A by 6, 1, 1, 2 dislocations on every second layer. So you need some kind of a mechanism like a pole mechanism to operate. But the point is, you know, that the deformation that we've just described completely explains the observed shape deformation and the observed habit plane because really the reaction stops here. This is our austenite crystal. When it changes by shear on every second plane, we see a shape like this, which is the correct observed sh uh, shape deformation. And of course, passing a Shockley partial on every second plane also gives us the correct HCB crystal structure. So there is no more complexity as in the case of the um, FCC to BCC transformation. So for this, uh, the Bain strain is equal to an invariant plane strain. So everything in the habit plane is fully coherent. And the habit plane is no longer irrational, it's exactly 111 austenite. Now there's something missing here, okay? You must have heard that because of the very high temperature, uh, something of the order of 6,000 Kelvin, and the huge pressure at the end center of the earth. Uh, we believe from experiments that we have hexagonal close back iron containing some nickel, okay? Now, what kind of experiment can you do on the core of the earth? Well, you send uh, from the surface longitudinal and transverse waves and you observe how they are reflected and from that, you can deduce some information about the solid iron present at the center of the earth, which is likely to be hexagonal closed packed. And you know, I, I don't know, but could it be a single crystal because it's been there for a very long time at a very high temperature? I just don't know. Uh, we can also do first principles calculations uh, where you know, you're not limited by experimental pressures to show that the conditions at the center of the earth would favor the hexagonal closed back form. Now, the worrying thing here is that uh, we have 
Define the deformation which takes the austenite to HCP martensite as a shear deformation. Shear doesn't cause a volume change, but the phase that is favored by pressure must have a higher density. So HCP iron is more dense than BCC or FCC iron. So there must be a volume change, and we haven't considered that. And there was a brilliant experiment done in uh, Birmingham University, where uh, the, this is how uh, epsilon martensite, thin epsilon martensite would appear in a transmission electron microscope if it is inclined to the plane of the thin foil. Uh, and you see a contrast there, okay? Now, if you use imaging conditions uh, in which the um, diffracted beam is at 90 degrees to the displacement vector of the sport, I don't want you to worry about this, then this should become invisible, all right? The, the presence of the epsilon martensite would become invisible. And you see that it hasn't become completely invisible. And these people recognize that. And they not only recognize that as a consequence of the volume contraction normal to the martensite. Okay, so this is a single stacking fold. Uh, so it's, it's like a, a nucleus of martensite. But they also did experiments where they varied the relative lattice parameters of the two phases and showed that the residual contrast, which should not be there, scales with the volume change. Okay? So this is the most brilliant experiment to show that the transformation from FCC to HCP is not simply a shear, but there's also a volume contraction normal to the one-on-one -on -one plane. And you can think about this as the first direct observation of the nucleus of martensite. Okay, um, I'm going to switch topics now and look at the thermodynamics of martensite because very frequently when we are designing steels, we need to be able to calculate things like the martensite start temperature and so forth. So here is a... a set of free energy curves of ferrite and of austenite at a particular temperature T1. If I draw a common tangent to these curves, then I get the equilibrium composition of the ferrite at temperature T1 and the equilibrium composition of austenite when these two phases are in contact, but for the temperature T1. If I take the locus of these points, as a function of temperature and plot them here, then I get what's called the AE3 phase boundary where this region is austenitic, and the AE1 phase boundary where this region is ferritic, and in between you have the two phase field. That you are familiar with. The item that doesn't appear on phase diagrams is this point here where the austenite and the ferrite of the same chemical composition have the same free energy, okay? And if I plot the locus of these points on this diagram, then I get what's called the T0 line. Now, why am I bothered about the T0 line? Well, look, if I have austenite of this chemical composition here, and I transform it to alpha of the same composition, then I get an increase in free energy, and that is not, not permitted uh, for a spontaneous transformation. On the other end, to the left of that green point, even if I have no composition change, I get a reduction in free energy. Okay? So this point and the T0 curve define the locus of all compositions beyond which it is impossible to get a transformation without any composition change. So martensitic transformation cannot happen in this region beyond T0. It's impossible. So I want you to understand this clearly. We're going to use this quite a lot. On the other hand, if the composition of the austenite is to the left of this T0 curve, then it is possible in principle for it to transform into martensite because there would be a reduction in free energy. Okay. Uh, now, Obviously, if you are not changing composition and yet the equilibrium phase diagram says that, you know, during transformation, they ought to have different compositions, 
then this reduction in free energy here is going to be less than for the equilibrium case. So here is the equilibrium transformation and I'm uh, changing this austenite into a mixture of ferrite and austenite of these compositions and this is a reduction in free energy. On the other hand, if I do not allow the composition to change, uh, then there is a smaller change in free energy. Okay, so that means that uh, your structure is not at equilibrium, which you know is is a trivial statement because we know martensite is not an equilibrium phase. Uh, but we have to recognize when calculating the free energies that we are dealing with something which does not have a composition change and is further away from equilibrium than the phase diagram would indicate. And there are other things which store energy inside the system when you form martensite. Uh, so we have the strain energy due to the shape deformation, which is really quite large, okay? That is a typical diffusional transformation might happen at 100 joules per mole. So 600 joules per mole due to the strain energy is a large quantity. Uh, if the martensite is twinned, then we have an additional term due to the cost of the twin interfaces. Uh, the gamma alpha interfacial energy contribution is relatively small when the plate is large, uh, not at the nucleation stage, but when the plate is large. And we might create some dislocation debris because the shape deformation is not completely uh, elastically accommodated and we add some stored energy term. If, if you add all these up, then it's roughly 700 joules per mole that we have to account for compared with the equilibrium transformation without a, com uh, compared with the transformation without a composition change. So although this change is smaller than the equilibrium case, when we account for all the stored energy terms, it's even smaller, okay? So uh, there's a lot of energy stored inside a martensitic structure, which is not stored in, for example, a diffusional transformation. But what this indicates, is that when the chemical free energy change exceeds the stored energy, uh, let's say 700 joules per mole, that is when martensite is triggered. So this, this, uh, this um, diagram is for a particular temperature, uh, but when we don't have a composition change, uh, we can express the free energy of austenite as a line as a function of temperature, and similarly that of ferrite. This corresponds to the T0 temperature where the two phases have exactly the same free energy and composition. Uh, and this is the point where the driving force for the transformation reaches the critical value that overcomes the stored energy of the system and any other terms. And that defines the martensite start temperature. Now, this is quite a powerful result because as long as you have the thermodynamic data for G gamma and G alpha. If I told you tomorrow, if I asked you tomorrow that look, calculate for me the martensite start temperature if I add gold to iron, okay? A certain amount of gold. If you had the free energy data, you could do that, okay? And these days we have huge thermodynamic data banks which have been carefully assembled and um, assessed. So, these are usually easy to calculate and you can even download uh, some software from my website uh, to try that out yourself. Okay, so now we are able to calculate the martensite start temperature and therefore we can use that in design. Uh, you know, if the martensite start temperature is too high, then the martensite will tend to be soft because not only does it form at a higher temperature where things might recover, but also during cooling from that temperature, it will temper itself. Uh, so there are various reasons why we need to control the martensite start temperature, uh, which will become clear uh, towards um, the later parts of the course. So let's just see what have we learned so far that can be useful in actually designing new steels. Well, the first thing is that we can, we can cut, uh, Sorry, um, the first thing is that we can calculate completely the crystallography. Now, why is that important? Well, uh, supposing we have a polycrystalline austenite grain structure and we, the grains are at random and we form martensite twins. 
then we will get a random distribution of Martin site orientations. However, if there is an externally imposed stress on the austenite, then certain variants of Martin site will be favored over other. You know, each grain of austenite can have 24 different orientations of Martin site plates. But if we apply an external stress, then those plates which comply with the external stress will operate more than those plates which oppose that stress. Exactly like the Schmidt law in slip deformation, where we apply a stress to a single crystal, some slip systems have a greater Schmidt factor than others. So that means that the Martin site orientations that we get in transforming austenite under stress will no longer be random. And we can calculate those orientations because there's an interaction energy between the applied stress and the Martin side plate, just like there is between a slip system and an applied stress. So this is a consequence of the transformation happening under the influence of an ex external stress. And you know, texture in materials is important because it determines anisotropy of your polycrystalline product, which is somewhere between a random polycrystal and a single crystal. So we can calculate transformation textures. The second consequence is, is, uh, is really quite important. Uh, we have shown that Martin Satic transformation is a, involves a disciplined movement of atoms, a coordinated movement of atoms, uh, you know, because it's a displacive transformation. And some, sometimes it's described as a military transformation. So you cannot actually sustain this coordinated movement of, trans uh, of atoms when you get to a grain boundary, okay? So Martin side plates do not cross the grain boundaries, okay? Uh, austenite grain boundaries. They are confined to the austenite grains. Now, earlier on, uh, we did an equation for the strain energy per unit volume due to the shear and dilatation of strains. And I said to you that, look, um, we could then calculate the thickness of a Martin side plate or the aspect ratio of the Martin side plate, C over R. Now, given that the plates are limited by austenite grains, we could set the length of the plate to be some function of the austenite grain. Uh, let's assume the mean linear intercept. And therefore, we can calculate the thickness of the Martin side plates. And that, that immediately gives you microstructural information. And we know the habit planes on which they form and so on. Now, unlike uh, displacive transformations, uh, diffusional transformations like the formation of ferrite at an austenite grain boundary, not limited by boundaries because they are uncoordinated transfer of atoms across the interface. Now, the important thing is that we use a lot of Martin Cidic steels which are fully martensitic, right? So, so there's nothing to uh, cover up these austenite grain boundaries and destroy them. And commercial steels inevitably contain impurities because we use, we produce them in such large quantities that it's not actually possible to make them pure at an economical cost. And phosphorus is, a, is the problem. Uh, so phosphorus tends to segregate to the prior austenite grain boundaries, and it makes them susceptible to impurity and brittlement. So the material will tend to break at the prior austenite grain boundaries. You can see this beautiful fracture surface where we have exposed all the prior austenite grain boundaries because of phosphorus and brittlement. Now you cannot actually um, make the material pure enough to avoid this. So one of the ways is to add about a quarter weight percent of molybdenum. And the effect of molybdenum is to getter the phosphorus. Gettering means to associate with the phosphorus and therefore it stops it from going into the austenite grain boundaries and is one solution to this impurity and brittlement problem. But when designing these steels, if you're not aware of this, you will end up with material which breaks up spontaneously, especially if you're making a strong steel. Uh, 
And the problem is worse if the austenite grain size is larger because the tendency, the concentration available to segregate to the grain boundary is, is uh, you know, you have a smaller uh, amount of grain boundary per unit volume and therefore you can get a greater saturation of phosphorus at those boundaries. So uh, we can calculate the size and shape of the margin site. And therefore, there are ways of estimating the mechanical behavior in terms of, of strength. Toughness is much more difficult to predict, uh, but let's assume we've controlled impurities, right? Then a very good rule is that if a cleavage crack can be deflected frequently during its path through the material, then you're winning, you get better toughness. And to do that, uh, you need a lots of orientations of martensite plates in a single austenite grain and you want the plates to be very fine so that the deflection happens very frequently. Now how do you make the martensite plates fine? Well if the austenite grain size is fine then the martensite plates will be fine because they cannot cross the austenite grain boundaries. So here is what we do. We first of all, uh, during hot rolling, the steel is very hot, uh, around 1200 degrees centigrade. And we need to stop the austenite grains from growing after they repeatedly recrystallize during this process, okay? So you add small carbonitride particles. In this case, it's uh, vanadium carbide uh, or niobium carbide, very small concentrations. And that's why this is known as microalloying. So, Typically in niobium, you would add only about 0.02 weight percent. And these, these would help to pin the austenite grain boundaries and therefore stop them from coarsening. But that isn't enough, you know, that, that uh, doesn't result in extremely fine grain size, but you could easily get a grain size of austenite of something like 10 to 20 micrometers, even though you're processing at very high temperatures. Now, there is another way, is that when you complete the rolling process, you finish it at a very low temperature, but still in the austenite phase field, so that the grains fail to recrystallize and they are severely pancaked. So these are austenite grains which have been flattened severely because we finished the hot rolling at a temperature before recrystallization occurs. And not only are they flattened, which means that we are effectively reducing the mean uh, linear intercept dramatically, but they contain what's known as deformation bands, okay, intense deformation bands. So that means that the coherent regions within each of these austenite grains is very small, of the order of 0.4 of a micrometer, which means that your martensite plates will be fine. But there is another consequence as well, which is beneficial. So I'm going to show you um, this. Um, uh, so this, uh, this is a, a pole figure of a single crystal of austenite, which is not deformed, right? So we are plotting the 100 martensite poles on a stereographic projection. Uh, at first, for equiex austenite grains, which are recrystallized and therefore are clean. And in each grain, we will form maximum of 24 possible variants of martensite. And this is what the pole figure would look like. Very clear distribution of poles. On the other hand, this is a severely pancaked structure containing lots of deformation bands, which reduce the coherent regions to a very small size and put orientation gradients throughout the grain. And in the single grain of austenite, we get thousands of different orientations of martensite plates, which are also extremely fine because they are limited by, for example, the pancaking and the deformation bands within the structure. So in principle, this should be not only strong martensite, but also extremely tough. It's really quite remarkable, you know, so, the strength here, we are talking about two gigapascals, okay? And yet, we have a, a choppy toughness at minus 40 degrees centigrade, which is like so, uh, more than 25 joules. 
at two gigapascals, that's remarkable, and elongations of the order of you know, 12, 12%. So it's a plastic material. And the fracture toughness, reproducibly, is about 75 megapascal root beaters at a strength level of two gigapascals. So these are really quite remarkable properties, more so because the material is simply produced by hot rolling and cooling on the production line. Okay, so there, there might be some water spraying, um, but essentially it is mass produced from the very simple ideas that we have discussed. Furthermore, you know, um, people would not dare normally to weld something like this. This is a completely weldable material. It doesn't break up because the structure is so fine. Okay, and even in the heat affected zone, it's constrained by those particles of uh, micro alloyed. Uh, carbides. So this is just the second lecture that we've had and you have learned some principles of steel design which result in really quite mater uh, remarkable material. So this is a completely new steel which is has been produced in many many tons and tested for a whole variety of applications such as uh, earth moving um, uh, impact abrasion wear of the type that happens with earth moving equipment and uh, ballistic testing and so forth and so on okay so it's a magic material it's it's tough it's very strong and it has a toughness of 75 megapascal root meters so this ends for the moment our discussion of martensitic transformations thank you So, Appa, mm. uh, I know this paper is about wear, mm. but what is the particular novelty in the steel that you are studying? The steel uh, is of very high strength, about uh, 2 gigapascals, and also it's uh, ductile and weldable. Uh, more, uh, above all, it's the uh, toughest, with uh, 75 gigapas uh, megapascal uh, square root meter. So, uh, with these combinations of steel, it, is, uh, it can be used for many applications. Now describe exactly what uh, the wear test that you are using mm. to assess this material uh, is. And uh, what is the hardness of the steel as well? The hardness of steel is about 600 wickers hardness. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the test we are doing is impact So abrasion. it's 600 wickers it's hardness and still it's really quite tough at 75 megapascal yes, root meters. That's yeah. remarkable, isn't remarkable, it? Remarkable, yes. Okay. Yeah. The test we are doing is impact abrasion, uh, where the specimens, are, uh, the steel is exposed to impact by the granite, and also abrasion when it is uh, uh, moving over the granite. So in a way, we are uh, testing the, its uh, toughness and also resistance to scratch, that is hardness. Okay. It's so how does how does, uh, how does the test work? Uh, we uh, uh, the test consists of a um, tumbler. Uh, and the samples are fixed at the center, uh, uh, the uh, fixed to the uh, rotating shaft, uh, whereas the granite is kept in the tumbler.
So they are both rotated in the same sense at very high speeds so that uh, the granite hit the um, st steel samples and also when the steel samples move above the granite it exposes to the abrasion. In a way it's impact as well as abrasion. So that's uh, quite severe and yes, in severe what injury. circumstances in real life do you get that sort of... Uh, uh, I can give you a very simple example of uh, transportation of material, let us say um, iron ore. Uh, during uh, loading, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the truck body exposes to impact loads. Right. The same truck body exposes to abrasion during the unloading. So, Appa, uh, who are the people you were working with? Because it's all very well to have some equipment, but you need uh, real expertise as well. Yes. So, who are the specific people you were working with when you visited uh, Tampere University? Uh, Dr. Wiltonen uh, is the lab in charge of the uh, group, mm -hmm. and uh, Professor Kuala is the uh, head of the uh, wear and other related work in the Tampere University. How does this novel steel? perform against standard materials or experimental alloys that have been subjected to precisely the same sort of impact tumbler. Now, when you wrote this paper, mm. um, there was a comment made by the referee yes. about uh, are you really testing mm -hmm. the steel mm -hmm. or the granite that is embedded yeah. in the steel yeah. and what is your um, So, uh, that was a very good comment uh, from mm -hmm. the referee and uh, that allowed us to understand the mechanism further. So, what we did, uh, it is very easy to find out the impact and abrasion areas uh, in um, backscattered electron microscopy. Uh, then uh, find uh, uh, and count the number of impact areas compared to the abrasion. Okay. If the if there is some difference between these uh, impact and abrasion events um, in both the in compared uh, to the quantum steel, right. then uh, it then it has something to do with uh, composite effect of the uh, granite the embedded yeah, in the steel. Granite embedded in the steel. Uh, surprisingly, we found that um, in both the steels, uh, I checked about 60 images, uh, in, uh, 60 images in um, quenched steel and 60 in the high toughness steel. So they gave a similar amount of um, impact and abrasion uh, areas. So okay, in a way, so, so is, you could uh, remove that as uh, a yes, variable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, another impact, uh, important um, uh, finding is that um, the impact and abrasion is 50-50. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so in a way, it is uh, you know a combination of both. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that that is quite interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah. Because uh, you know the toughness matters when you have impact. Impact. Uh, yeah. yeah. Dominant Although impact. even with abrasion, I suppose you get bits and pieces coming off. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What was uh, Matthew Pete's role? Uh, well, Matthew Pete is the one who designed the steel uh, for such um, um, uh, to develop steel to have very high toughness and also very high strength. And weldable. So, weldable as well. Uh, and then uh, Tata Steel produced mm. the steel in uh, Midani. In large quantity. Large quantity. Yeah. So that's, right, uh, that's why we have Matthew and uh, Saurabh uh, as a part of our group in, the, okay. uh, in completing this work. Okay, thank you very much. Thank well you. done. Okay.